Good afternoon. I think we'll get started as we have a few more uh, people filtering in. Well, welcome everybody to our panel discussion on clean energy and American leadership, risks and opportunities. It's really wonderful to see you all and to see so many students in the audience. And I really want to shout out a, a special welcome to the high school students from Prospect, Prospect Mountain High School. Thanks for coming. I'm Cameron Wake, research professor in climatology at the Institute for the Study of Earth, Oceans and Space, the Josephine A. Lamprey Professor in Climate and Sustainability at the UNH Sustainability Institute, and moderator for our panel discussion today. I'd like to start by thanking uh, the organizations that helped pull this uh, event together. From the University of New Hampshire, we had the Sustainability Institute and Climate Solutions New England, Carsey School of Public Policy, the Center for Social Innovation and Enterprise, and the Institute for the Study of Earth, Oceans, and Space. And we worked very closely with our external partners, NextGen Climate, to pull this off. I want to provide a little discussion for our, uh, a little context for our discussion today. Climate changes. It always has and always will. The only difference today is that there is an extensive and ever-growing body of scientific evidence that shows that humans are the main drivers of climate change. And once you understand that and once you accept it, you know that the future climate is literally in our hands. The climate that our children and grandchildren inherit depends fundamentally on the decisions we make today and over the next decade on how we produce and how we use energy. So there's considerable risk, but where there is risk, there is opportunity. One of those opportunities is, an, as, and I would call it a solution, is clean energy, which we will certainly hear about quite a bit today. Another part of the solution will be discussed in the upcoming United Nations 21st Conference on Climate Change that will be held in Paris in December. Uh, I remain guardedly optimistic that an agreement will come out of Paris that will align nations around the globe to reduce emissions of heat-trapping gases. My optimism is based on emerging leadership in the United States. We've already committed to reduce emissions by at least 26% below 2005 levels by 2025. Another part of that leadership is provided by institutions. For example, the total combined emissions from UNH have dropped 35% since 2005, and we have done it while growing our student body and growing the number of uh, students that are housed on campus. I'd like to take a minute to talk directly to the UNH students here today. Every day I am heartened by my interactions with you. I see your promise, I see your commitment, and I see your intelligence. One example of this is, the, is it took bold student leadership that led to the creation of the environmental, social, and governance option that is now part of the UNH Foundation Endowment. Another example, the annual undergraduate research conference where over a thousand of you present the results of your original research. It has been and remains the largest undergraduate research conference in the nation. At UNH, we educate the next generation of leaders who will solve the challenges posed by climate change. Three emerging programs I would like you to consider. The first is a dual major in sustainability, which will be accepting applications starting in January. The second is the uh, recently created Masters in Public Policy that will be offered through the Carsey School that will allow students to integrate issues of energy and climate and environment and policy. And last but not least is the UNH Climate Fellowship Program, a 10 week long paid internship where students work to implement integrated solutions to our changing climate here in New England. If you want more information on any of those, please feel free to come down and talk to me or email me at any time. All right. So now I am honored and privileged to introduce our distinguished panel today. Uh, first, uh, to almost to my far left, we have Tom Steyer, California business leader, very successful former head fund manager, philanthropist, advanced energy advocate, president of NextGen Climate, an organization that he founded in 2013 to prevent climate disaster and promote prosperity for all Americans. We have Michael Etlinger to my direct left, founding director, UNH Carsey School of Public Policy, former senior director for the Fiscal Economic Policy at the Pew Charitable Trust, and before that, vice president of economic policy at the Center for American Progress. Three people over, we have Clay Mitchell, happy to have Clay as a lecturer at UNH now in the Department of Natural Resources and the Environment. He is also founding partner of Revolution Energy. Clay has developed several energy projects and policies that contribute to secure energy resources and save money for clients in the public and private sectors. Venu Rao, 
serves as a chair of the Hollis Town Energy Committee, and in that capacity, he has done a great deal of work at divesting the town from fossil fuels. He is currently an adjunct professor at Southern New Hampshire University and is a retired program manager at Lockheed Martin and Harris Corporation. And last, but certainly not least, is Amira O'Day, who is the New Hampshire campus organized for Next Gen Climate Action. She studied geography at the University of Puerto Rico, and she was also president of the Eco Environmental Society. She was awarded the Brower Youth Award from the Earth Island Institute as it involved with the Sierra Student Coalition. So the way this is going to work today is uh, each of our panelists is going to open up with some uh, opening remarks that speak to the topic of clean energy and American leadership, uh, risks and opportunities. Uh, I'll have uh, a couple of questions and you all have the opportunity to ask questions. There's volunteers circulating in the audience with these green cards. Please write your question on the green card, pass it down to me, and I will try to ensure that we ask as many of those questions as possible. If you listen to the conversation in the United States of America about energy and climate, the answer to we need to do something progressive on energy is you're going to destroy the economy. And what we're saying is actually if you do the work as opposed to just giving us a knee-jerk reaction, the work says we will create jobs, we will make families better off, we will reduce people's electricity bills, and we will grow the, the overall GDP. And that is important because from an opportunity standpoint, we want to show that this is the opportunity to put Americans to work, particularly in good paying jobs. Because if you look at what's going on in the United States, I'm sh I know this is true across the board, that basically as our country grows, as our GDP grows, it turns out it's not being shared in the way it was historically. And so the bottom 60% over the last 25 years have seen their incomes go down since 1990, which is an amazingly long time for that to be true, at a time when the economy actually was growing overall, it was just disproportionately going to the people at the high end of the income spectrum. So when we look at opportunities, we're looking at opportunities for jobs, we're looking at for opportunities for American leadership in terms of new companies, new businesses, creating new, whole new industries, and then shipping them overseas. When we look at the risks, we're really talking about something that is increasingly obvious, but also increasingly severe as people make their projections. So that the numbers, just to use economics again for a second, the, the assumption right now is, or the projection is, that if we don't, business as usual on energy will cause the GDP of the United States to be 5% lower in 2050. So that's a big number, but it also is a number that's at least twice what people were predicting last year. If you look at sea level rise, sea level rise last year, the, the consensus agreement was there was a one in 20 chance of four and a half feet of sea level rise by the end of the century. People are now using 6.6 .6 feet. It's up 50% in a year of projection. This year, last year was the hottest year ever. This year will be the hottest year ever by a lot. So what we're seeing in terms of news from the natural world, so this is what I would put out there as risk, is not a consensus that's remained steady over the last five years. It's a consensus that's getting much worse. So from the point of view of urgency and cost of inaction, the risk is getting a lot higher. The good news is if you look at the technology, our ability to solve this is much better. I don't know how much you guys, time you guys spend looking at kilowatt per hour costs, but the projection is that solar will be cheaper than fossil fuels in most of the United States by 2017. Wind is already the cheapest energy source in a lot of the United States right now. Two-thirds of the new generation in the United States, over two-thirds, will be renewable this year. So there is something going on in technology that is much better than most Americans know. So when people say we cannot do that, this, they are wrong. These are, as the costs come down, they've not just come down, they're going to continue to come down because that's how technology works. If you think about cell phones or TVs or any technology-based product, it's not like they get better and then they plateau. They get better and then they get better and then they get better and that's what's happening with energy too. Let me make one more point about opportunities. Americans have really moved on this. 
72% of Republicans want more clean energy. Over half of Republicans think the climate is changing, thinks it, think it's caused by human activity, and want the government to do something. That's a number that's moved 12% in the last six months. So what we're seeing is a very powerful move in public sentiment. What we are not seeing is a concomitant, very powerful move in people running for office. And so when we think about risks and opportunities and what's going to happen, we're seeing the American public having moved. We're seeing business having moved around the United States. The Pope actually was the best representative of clean energy and a need for climate solutions ever. And the Joint Chiefs of Staff are strongly on our side. So when you think about conservative icons, people who really talk to the basic values of society, they actually are all on our side. What is lagging is elected officials and people who are running for office. So when we think about what we're trying to do, it really is a question of how are we going to move up the urgency in the people of the United States, not just Democrats, across the board. Because actually, I've always felt this was going to be the challenge for, it's not going to, we're not going to solve this in Paris. We're not going to solve this in the presidential election of 2016. This is going to be a long saga of figuring out the right thing to do. So that, I'll, I'll just make two more points. One is, we only want to talk about solutions. You know, we're through talking about at NextGen, we're through talking about whether it's happening or whether we should do something. What we're asking every candidate on both sides of the aisle is, what, are you, what is your plan? How are we going to do this? The way that Americans come up with new ideas is we talk about it and fight about it loudly in the public square. So put out your plan and let, explain to us why that's the best way to do this, why this is the best way for the people of New Hampshire or the people of California or the people of the United States of America to do it that way because we know we have to do it. So that's one thing I'd say solutions. The second thing I'd say is this. America is good at stuff like this. Big problems that are intimidating and scary. You know, the Winston Churchill's famous quote was, Americans always do the right thing after they try everything else. Well, at this point, I think we have tried everything else. And I think this is the kind of thing, it's technology driven. We're a technology driven country. It's values driven. We're a country that can come together and coalesce around values, and this is exactly and let me say this, for the students in the room, this is going to be a millennially driven process. People under the age of 35 are the heart and soul of who wants to get this done. And I think that it is, you know, this is absolutely, as a participatory democratic society, this is the time for us to do this. Between now and November of 2016, we, it, this is our absolute opportunity. And I honestly think the planets are aligning for everybody in the United States to hear this message, but it is not going to happen because somebody comes on high and delivers it. That is not how our country works. The way that our country works is for it, the message comes up from the bottom. So my request is for everybody in this room to be part of that process because that is, you know, we have over 200 years of that's how we make decisions in the United States. And so, you know, my friend George Schultz likes to say democracy is not a spectator sport. It really isn't. So it is really incumbent on people like the people in this room, including the people in this room, to take the bull by the horns and speak out about this and demand solutions from the people running from office, for office and ask the people in your communities why they aren't behind this as strongly as they should be because we absolutely have to. Thank you. Thanks for that intro, Tom, and that, and that call to action. Uh, Michael, perhaps you could go next and talk a little bit about uh, the policy realm and uh, how we might help solve this. Sure. So uh, my job is to summarize uh, U.S. energy, clean energy policy in three minutes. Um, uh, but I'm going <laughs> to immediately go. I'm going to immediately go off script. Um, uh, okay, uh, uh, to say that 
So having worked on these issues for five years at the Center for American Progress from the economics side, being the head of the economics team there, I just wanted to, you know, Tom mentioned the new Next Gen report, and it's actually a very important contribution, having been in these fights and knowing how much that as you're in these discussions, it's what about jobs? You know, what about the economy? And, and even people who you wouldn't think is necessarily being on the other side kind of from an environmental perspective, everyone worries about that. Everyone worries about that, even people who are sympathetic uh, at, you know, on, the, on the underlying issue. So it's an important report. Uh, okay, now. Uh, 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 U.S. Uh, clean energy policy in three minutes. Um, you know, I think one thing that's important to just keep in mind is that the United States doesn't really have a clean energy plan, unlike, say, Europe or China, and that, that's problematic for a couple of reasons. You know, the most obvious thing is that to have a, uh, if you're trying to solve some problem in the long term, it's good to have a long term plan on how you're going to do it, because otherwise it's hard to get it done. So that's the obvious thing. But it also has shorter term implications in the sense that, um, you know, if people who are making decisions about their behaviors now, about investment decisions now, they want to know what the context is, what the, what the markets are going to be like in the future in which those investments are taking place. So, so the long term, the lack of a long term vision and, and, you know, widespread embracing of a long term vision actually hurts us in the short term too in getting the kinds of investments we need and want. Um, but that's not to say, there may not be a long-term plan, but there is a lot going on. And uh, it's important to understand, you know, Tom was pointing out that the markets and just the cost of things are driving things in a good direction. But it's important when you're moving policy to also be able to tell people that policies have actually worked. And so I think that's why it's good to understand that the U.S. does have a number of policies that have been been quite effective. You know, people know about the CAFE standards and about the new uh, EPA uh, 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 power, um, clean, clean power, power thank you, <laughs> clean power initiative that's moving forward. Um, but there are also a set of incentives and subsidies that are in place that, are ma that have made a really big di difference. And a lot of these uh, either were created mm -hmm. or were expanded as part of the Recovery Act in, in 2009, which I did some work on. And so, you know, take for example the stuff that's happened in manufacturing in terms of the Department of Energy loan programs, their tax uh, uh, credits to benefit those things. Those have been very important in, in particularly the auto industry that U.S. manufacturers now are really leading the world in a lot of the technologies having to do with uh, clean, cleaner uh, automobiles, uh, but really beyond that to other, to other industries as well. And you know, people, you hear about Solyndra, um, you know, as with any new technology and new set of investments, there are going to be failures. But overall, those programs, the, the Department of Energy loan programs, have been very successful and, in fact, actually made money for the U.S. government. So uh, that, that's an example of an area that's been, um, that's been very uh, successful. Uh, I, you know, the other thing is that we, we have these uh, production tax credits and investment tax credits that benefit the uh, implementation of particularly wind and solar energy, and those have been very instrumental in a lot of the expansions uh, that we've seen in those spaces. But this is another, this is an example of where not thinking long term is problematic. These things are always passed on a temporary basis, one year, two years at a time. And so, again, we were, they've spurred a lot of investment, but they've not spurred nearly the investment they would have created had there been a long term commitment to these things, because the, the investors, the industry, cannot go all all in, not knowing whether these benefits are going to be in place two, three, two, three years uh, down the road. Um, you know, there's also a lot going on at the state level, and those things are really important. And I think you know we'll hear about that from others. I, I, I would just like to say that there there is a limit, I think, to how much those policies can move things. Uh, unless the market's really driving things in those ways anyway, just because it's very hard for states to have very different policies uh, on these things. Uh, the last thing I'll just say is I also, it's, it's important to also keep an eye on what's happening internationally, that policies in other countries can also have huge effects on what's happening in the United States. And a clean example of that is the feed-in tariffs that Germany has, which 
and, and sort of on the demand side, so promoting demand for in particular solar, solar power. Uh, and then on the production side uh, in China, the, the support that's been given, uh, particularly again in solar, but also in wind, uh, sort of driving production of those, those technologies. And that's important for the U.S. because that's been a lot of what's been driving the technological advance worldwide because you create a lot of demand, uh, technology moves, it, it brings things to scale, makes things cheaper. So international policies are also very important when you're, when you're looking at the broad perspective of clean energy policies. So hopefully that wasn't too much over three minutes. Thank you, Mike. That's great. And, and moving right along to... Uh... <laughs> Thanks, Kevin. He just came to see me, apparently. So. <laughs> um, uh, I wonder if we could get some, uh, some state perspective on this, actually. Let's start with, uh, with you, Clay, perhaps both from a policy perspective as well as, a, as an energy project perspective. Um, thanks. Uh, so, uh, the state. <laughs> we, the state of our state is not good. Um, we, I, I've spent the last uh, seven, six, seven years seven years, uh, putting steel on the ground, putting these projects on the ground, financing them. I spent 50% of my time financing, 50% of my time uh, building them, and then 50% of my time <laughs> trying to change the policies of New Hampshire <laughs> so that we can continue this. And yes, that's how much work it takes. I, I read something today that kind of uh, means a lot to me in the New York Times, and I just want to say that so that you think I read the New York Times. Um, <laughs> Climate change and clean energy is not a special interest. Um, and, and I want you to remember that because I, I think that this discussion has been marginalized in that context. And um, it, it, the fight of trying to get consistent, stable po policy at the state level has been brutal. And um, you know, I'd, I'd love a two or three year window uh, to happen at the state of New Hampshire level. Um, we, we are currently dealing with a, a net metering cap that was randomly selected back in 2008 with no, you know, no study, no regard for the market, no regard for technical or economic capabilities. And it, that cap is at 1% of our load, uh, which is 50 megawatts for solar and renewable energy to be grid connected. To our south, uh, they're struggling with lifting it above their current limit, which is 1,600 megawatts. Um, it's, it, we're, we're kind of an embarrassment, and I'm happy to say that because uh, it's true. Uh, and I, I, I want people to get a little frustrated about it. I know my class is frustrated, um, and I, I promise we're going to get to hope and opportunities later in the semester. Um, <laughs> but the goal here is to elevate this discussion because as, as my class knows, um, I, I think that the price of solar has equalized uh, to the kilowatt hours when we're talking about uh, fossil fuel generated energy. And, you know, as, as we have looked at some of these reports, particularly supplemented by the NextGen report, when we consider all the subsidies, the IMF has recently released a report, I think it was last month, where they quantified the global subsidies for fossil fuels, and that number is $5.4 trillion. It's 6.5% of global GDP is being sub is spent subsidizing the fossil fuel industry. So not only will clean energy create new jobs and do other things, it will take that money and remove it from that and put it where it needs to be, in your pockets, in my pockets, in education, in healthcare, and other things that develop the parts of the country that we care about, and the globe. And I think that that's one of the issues that needs to be brought down to the state level, while the energy from all the change needs to be brought up from all of you. <laughs> Thank you, Clay. Venu, we'd love to hear a little bit of what's uh, going on in Hollis. Thank you. Uh, uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Venu Rao. I'm from a small town called Hollis, which is the southernmost part of the state. It's a small town in the sense 7,800 uh, residents. And uh, when I saw the title of uh, today's seminar, which said green energy leadership. I said this is an important topic because I wanted to come and talk about the obvious first with all the professors and all the educated audience. Leadership is not a job title or a job description. It is a state of mind. The person who does the right thing is a leader. And this thing can be done at the town level, at the state level, and at the national level. And we took a job at the town level. We said we should do the right thing. 
So what we have done in our Hollis Energy Committee, we decided that we want to make a town 13 municipal buildings fossil fuel free first, because that's what is the basic contribution to our climate change. So we put together an integrated plan. So we said we have to get rid of fossil fuels from hot water and heating, electricity, and transportation. I think we can do in hot water, heating, and electricity another five to 10 years. It's the transportation is the long pole in the tent because we have backhoes, we have it, dump trucks, and we have to see how, what strategies we have to come up with those. But when I first ordered this uh, as a team about four years ago, it took me four months to convince my elected officials to approve to apply for a grant. <laughs> and the first thing we did is we got a grant for a quarter million dollars to go upgrade all the buildings. And we saved $120,000 in our electric bills. And about six months ago, it took me 30 minutes to approve. <laughs> we, we, got rid of the oil, oil tanks and oil burners from our police station and the town hall and replaced with them with the uh, wood pellet burners. And when we were trying to put together a budget for the next year, our selectmen were really impressed because the previous budget for those two buildings were $29,000, now it is $15,000. So the next thing we are doing is, we already done the feasibility study, we're going to put a a wood chip district heating system for the high capacity buildings like school buildings. And then also we have plants in place for 10 acres of solar farms. So these are the things we are trying to do, the right things to help. And I have, as we go and discuss, I have a pet, we, pet fees with some of the policies that we as a town, small town feels, and I will talk about that. What are those things from the policy point of view that would help us. Most of the time we feel like we have one hand tied behind and we are working with one hand. So if policies can help us, we can work with the both hands. So as the discussion starts, I'll talk about them. I won't take all the time right now. All right, thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> and Amira, perhaps you could share a, a personal perspective on, on this global issue that's facing your generation. Yeah, um, hi, so my name is Amira and I'm from Puerto Rico. I, I've cared about environmental issues since I can remember. And it's because um, in 1994, my country was affected by a really, really bad drought. So that influenced me in the fact that my first memories are me opening the tap and not having any water and carrying buckets of water so we could use it to shower. And um, the few times we had water, we had to, when, when I opened the tap, it was just brown, nasty water. And I've had conversations with some friends and family members about, what's your first memory? And it's always like playing around with your family at Christmas, present, something cool, and mine sucks. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that, that caused an interest in environmental issues, especially water. So during my life, I was involved in, as a volunteer in many, in many, for many causes, but I didn't really get involved until I went to college where I, um, was the president of an environmental organization and there I led a campaign to ban bottled water from our campus and teach about um, water privatization. But as I worked on that campaign, I learned a lot about how water crisis is related to climate change. And that had me thinking, water is my real passion and the issue I care most about and this thing is being affected by climate. I have to do something about it. I can't just sit back and complain. So I'm, I've started to work in, around climate issues ever since I realized that. And I'll continue working on that until we win. <laughs> Uh, 
All right, so I've got the thank you for your, uh, for your questions. Uh, several have come in. I'm going to start with one uh, that I came up with. Um, and Tom, this goes to something, <laughs> moderator's prerogative, right? Uh, something that, uh, 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 that, uh, that I want to pick up on something that you said about sort of you've seen this real movement even amongst conservatives. Uh, so, in the Granite State Survey, which happens quarterly, our sociologist here at UNH, Larry Hamilton, has shown that climate change, even with that movement, remains the most polarizing issue that separates us, more than abortion, uh, uh, more than gay marriage, more than immigration. So I'm wondering what we can do, all of us, on both sides uh, of the political spectrum, to bridge the political divide and, and find common ground to build the clean energy economy. And I'd love, after Tom answers, if any of you else want to jump in. Feel free. So, so this has been the most partisan issue in the United States since about 2008, um, which is a little shocking when you think about the fact that we all live on the same planet, we're all looking at the same future together. There's really no um, Republican or Democratic future. It is just one shared future for our country. Um, what we have been doing in 2015 is we have been asking people across the aisle to talk about this. And I think that the, talking about it in terms of climate sometimes can be polarizing. And therefore, what we're really, I think that the words clean energy are actually something that are much less polarizing. So we really don't care to have people surrender and tell us that they were wrong and we were right and that you know, we're morally superior. That is not something we're looking for. What we are looking for is a conversation about solutions and plans and action. And that is the way that we're looking, because I think when we get down to practicalities, we get down to actual economics, jobs, ways of proceeding, I think that's something where a lot of the emotion and the verbiage and the political competition can go away. And so as we think about this, the issue really is, I mean, it, one where we think there is a way for us all to talk about this without trying to play any kind of gotcha or partisan games, but really to discuss maybe, you know, heatedly what the right way is to go around this. And I'm hoping that, in fact, you know, if you look at the Republican voters, they have moved a long way to a large extent. And I think it's really important. I'd say one is message, but two is messenger. It is really important that businesses speak up on this, which they are doing. It, it, the Pope was truly significant. And the national security issue part of this is a huge deal. When you think about how much time and human life and money we expend on keeping oil lanes open around the world and keeping that whole fossil fuel economy safe so that, when we, can, so that we can operate our uh, economy. The fact of the matter is, if we could have American manufactured energy here, that is good for us on a host of bases that is important to every American, not just Democrats. So from our point of view, message and messenger are really critical to t kind of take the emotion out of this so we can proceed to try and figure out the best solutions without necessarily having to agree on everything else. Great. Tom, I have a uh, comment on that. Why not we promote action rather than message? I come from a very, very conservative town. Mm -hmm. And uh, the way the whole town got interested in doing this, we are getting rid of all the oil tanks and putting together a wood chip center burning systems, going through solar energy and all this. The message we have is that saving the money for the residents. Second thing is sustainability. The message is, we can live sustainably without sacrificing <coughs> our standard of living. And the third thing is, it's a moral issue. We are 5% of the population in the world and consume 25% of the natural resources. That's not right. And people will realize whether it's a Republican or a Democrat. And these are the three messages. We, every meeting, we bring it up, and we are winning. So it's the action probably will have more impact than climate has a, a yeah. starting point. I completely agree. I mean, that's why we're really trying to focus on a discussion of solutions, of behave, you know, actions. So on, on the state level, I would, I would add another adjective, and I would add domestic uh, to that, because um, it's important to understand in New Hampshire, and 
we've studied this as we've studied everything, except for the reason we have so many studies, <laughs> which is a bill I'm trying to propose this year. Um, we export two-thirds of our money for energy immediately. When, when, when we purchase energy in New Hampshire, two-thirds of that cash leaves the state instantaneously. Um, we need domestic energy sources so that we can keep our dollars domestic. And I think that's a message that we lose uh, despite the fact that we've studied it. Um, and I, I think that's an important adjective to, to add, domestic clean energy. Yeah, I just, uh, you know, Tom's implying something that I, I, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but I'll say what I think. Um, that, that, you know, and this is a little controversial, but I do think that like the debate over causation is a polarizing debate and an unnecessary debate in the sense that there's a logic to if humans caused it, humans can solve it. But, there's a, but it's actually, to my mind, the cause isn't all that important in the sense that the real question is do we have a problem and can humans solve it? And if you get agreement that there's a problem and you get agreement that humans can solve it, it doesn't really matter what caused it. And I think a lot of times we get into this, we get bogged down into this causation. I think it's been a trap, actually, that's been laid because, you know, I mean, it may be evident to people who understand science and, and, and you know, sort of respect elite scientists, but, but we don't have to win that fight. So I just think that that's, anyway, a lot of people disagree with that, but I think it's an important way to look at it. Well, again, focused on, on solutions, which I, I think is a common thread from a lot of, of the work that you're talking about. Uh, here's one of the questions uh, from the audience, uh, and this uh, we've kind of uh, referenced this already, but I think we can go into it a little deeper. Uh, what needs to happen to convey the true urgency of the climate crisis? So there's certainly some, there's some leadership that's happening, there's some action that's happening, uh, but Joe and Jane on the street don't always really think about this as, as the main issue. So what's uh, uh, to convey the true uh, urgency of the climate crisis to those who do not take it seriously, who do not think it will affect us anytime soon? How do we get the rest of Americans on board with our clean energy agenda? Can I just take a whack at that? Please do. You know, it, what we've found, I, I co-chaired um, a proposition in California in 2010 that was an environmental. It was a fight between businesses and a couple oil companies wanted to re reduce our progressive energy uh, policies. So it was, I, I co-chaired it with a Republican, George Schultz, who was been, was in Eisenhower, worked for Eisenhower, he worked for Nixon, he worked for Reagan, he's you know, 94 years old now. Um, but we basically felt like the conversation of either we're going to have good jobs or we're going to have a sustainable environment has played out in California over the years and jobs always win. So when it comes down to if it's cast as a fight between jobs and the environment, we, you can expect to lose. And in fact, there had been a fight four years previously on those lines where the environmentalists spent over $70 million and got 42% of the vote. So what we said is, we have to do this differently. The way that people relate to this is pretty straightforward around the United States. It's local human interests. The reason people vote is because of something that's going to affect them or their family or their community in a profound way. That's why they vote. So that if you get more attenuated than that. I, I like to say in California, no one in California is related to a polar bear, and no one in California lives above the Arctic Circle. So we may, we may care about polar bears, we may care about what happens to Arctic ice, we don't vote on it. What we vote on is jobs in California, the health of our kids, and this is associated with 3.3 million Californians have asthma, so it's associated with clean air. We vote on costs and the ability to run businesses in California, and we vote on whether it's a fair democracy. Because there's a lot, there's a sense, there was a sense in that election and there's a sense in a lot of elections that our democracy is not fair anymore and that money's taking over. And if, that, if people get a sense of that actually going on, they get very angry very, very fast. So when we talk about educating people on climate, what we really need to do is talk to them about how it's going to impact their community in, in a way that they relate to because that's the only way you actually change votes. So even though there are gonna be people, look, I quit my job to work on this, you know, three years ago because I feel like 
you know, there is this global sustainability issue that's critical and it's the challenge of our generation. But the way to talk to people who don't spend their lives thinking about this, who are pressed for money, who are pressed for time, who spend too much time in their car commuting, and are really have an awful lot of concerns that are very day to day, is to bring it home to them very specifically on jobs, costs, health, and political corruption. Um, I feel that um, along with what Tom mentioned, people already care about this in some sort of way, but they don't always know how related it is to them. So creating a sense of urgency um, is very important, but people usually um, respond to it faster when they see how intersectional climate is when they see how closely it is related to poverty, to immigration, to wars, to race. This is all very connected. And people, especially young people, um, we care al about a lot of issues. And even though people have their preferred issues, they feel more interested in working around climate when they see how climate directly affects the, the issue they care about. That's wonderful. Uh, so changing uh, topics a, a little bit here, uh, what are some bold ways that philanthropy and alternative sources of funding can accelerate the transition to a new clean energy economy? I am not a philanthropist. <laughs> I, if I had a lot of money, I would be one, though. <laughs> But, well, I, but I'll throw one pitch at one thing out there that's coming potentially is, uh, you, you know, a, a, a lot of uh, solar attention is being focused on what's called community energy. Uh, and, and I think it, it's more than just the rules that allow group net metering, which is a complicated, convoluted way to, a, a, to apportion the benefits. There are different ways to do investments and in projects that allow a group of people come together to make a project happen. And um, that, that's been in place a long time. Crowdsource funding is, is about ready to be approved, I believe, by the the SEC uh, for these for projects and work and I think that that's going to be an interesting way to do it because these projects make money and if you want to invest in a community thing that makes money why not and and in so far it's been the SEC that's kind of been in the way of that so that's coming down the line and, and keep an eye open for that 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 should be uh, coming out in the next 90 days or something and, and there are other examples, just quickly, there are other examples around the country where uh, particularly community development finance institutions have raised capital to in, invest in, in local projects that have been important, so. All right, um, one of my students' questions here, they boldly put their name at the top. <laughs> uh, uh, and, and a little bit political, so, but I'll be interested because I suspect all of you will have a perspective on this. In the recent GOP debate, tax reform was a hot topic. Uh, if, if a Republican is voted into office, presumably as president, um, what will be the effect, what, what will effect will tax reform have on renewable energy technologies? Will it be positive, negative, or neutral? Well, I'll, I'll jump in on this, I guess. Um, so, uh, you, you know, one of the odd things about the U.S. tax code is we spend a ton of money through the tax code on supporting uh, fossil fuels, and then we spend a bunch of money supporting clean energy. So y you sort of think we ought to like decide, right? Um, because we're just, you know, we're fighting ourselves in this stuff. And I think, you, you know, if I, I, my, you know, it's hard to predict what would happen in tax reform, but um, having worked on several tax reform efforts, but I, I think sort of the baseline tax reform that you see is, is would, would, eliminate the subsidies on both sides of that equation. Um, and I think, but I actually think that net hurts clean energy, even though the subsidies are probably bigger on the fossil fuel side, because there's already a big built infrastructure, a bigger built infrastructure on the fossil fuel side. And so sort of the, the, the clean energy side, you know, to transform the way we do this needs more nurturing. Than, uh, than the fossil fuel <coughs> side. So, you know, if I had to predict, that would be the baseline, then there's gonna be a whole bunch of fighting. So, you know, the reality is that that's sort of the baseline 
Republican plan and probably where Democrats would be too. But then there's going to be okay, okay, we're getting rid of all the tax breaks, but now what are we going to what are we going to keep? And I think the reality is that Democrats would end up having to be part of any discussion like that. And then it becomes what are they fighting for? Like what do they what do they want? And because uh, the Democrats will get something, and would it be clean energy credits or would it be the earned income tax credit, things for low income people? And that would be, you know, there'd be a lot of tough choices on the Democratic side of what they uh, decided to make their asks. You know, assuming, I mean, obviously there are a million different possible alignments politically that could affect who has more power in these debates. But I think as a, you know, that's a broad characterization, I think, of what would happen. Thanks, Michael. Uh, Venu and then Tom. Tom, you go ahead. You sure? Go ahead. That's awfully polite. Um, I think if you think about what the government does in terms of energy, they do three things. There are three real roles for government in this. One is putting up research dollars because businesses don't really do blind research in the way that government does. And that's been actually a very important positive role for government since the Second World War. We've had great returns on it in the Defense Department. We've had great returns from it in the Energy Department. That is obviously something that would get gutted because if you actually look at the Republican tax reforms, they're reductions on taxes for high earners. So therefore, what they're really talking about is shrinking government, and that means shrinking everything. And one of the things that's easiest to cut is research dollars. So I would say the first thing that would happen is we'd have much less research dollars for working out new technologies for clean energy. The second thing they do, the question is, how do you get a level playing field between different technologies, between fossil fuels, renewables, energy efficiency? So I don't think that's really going to be addressed in the, we have not seen uh, any policy tax reforms coming out of the Republican side that have to do with trying to put a tax on pollution in energy. So I think it's fair to say that we're not going to see that, but what we also will see I mean, I know this isn't part of tax reform, but the third thing that governments do about energy is they have rules. They have rules about how many miles per gallon the average fleet has to produce. They have rules about b building efficiencies. They have rules about clean air and clean water. The EPA Clean Power Plan are rules that the government is putting out. And if you listen, almost the, those rules that have to do with clean air, clean water, and climate, to the extent that they're executive rules, the people running for office on the Republican side have said, to a large extent, we're taking them out day one. Uh, I just want to add a, a town's per perspective. Uh, as we started with as a leadership, the, the, the right thing to do can happen at the town level, at the state level, at the federal level. If the right people are not there to do the right things at the federal level, I, that would be a trouble for the small towns like ours, of course. But are we going to stop doing what we're doing? No. It might take a little longer, <laughs> but that's what we'll do. So that's what Americans do. So it will be a little more tough, but we'll continue to do what we're doing. I'll be brief. Um, I, I believe that if, if tax reform was adopted that eliminated, uh, truly eliminated subsidies for both energy sources, that, um, and here's the hope part, uh, I believe that you will see renewable energy actually be more cost competitive than fossil fuels. Uh, I, the price of solar as a, as a you know a commodity, so to speak, the, the equipment and the installs have dropped 50 percent since 2009. Oil has not you know we, we, we are propping up or propping down, however you want to say it, the, the price of electricity and the price of uh, fossil fuels through subsidies. And if you limit that and we get to this question of the true cost of energy, uh, you will see uh, renewables flow to the top. Guarantee it. But, but there's one denim to that. We're not talking about the costs of polluting through fossil fuels. None of these tax reforms are actually talking about an actual level playing field where if you pollute, you have to pay for the cost of your pollution. I have not seen that. So until we have people paying for the pollution that they cause, we do not have a level playing field. We can get rid of all the subsidies, but the fact of the matter is we're giving them a gigantic free ride to pollute. And I don't think that would be part of the Republican reform plan. So. <laughs> um, we, we've touched upon this a, a little bit, but the, there's been a couple of questions on this front. Is um, And it moves a little bit away from the economy, but uh, something that's really emerging in this discussion across the country is how can a clean energy agenda also promote environmental justice? Uh, 
Okay. Environmental justice. What does it mean? It, we see it in California, and I know it better than California than I do in New Hampshire, but I know what it means in California. It means that the people who have asthma and the people who breathe dirty air live in poor communities. And it means to a large extent, so the first thing is if we're going to clean this up, it's going to be important that those kids, 3.3 million Californians, can breathe clean air. The second thing that's true is, if we're going to do what we're talking about doing, it's going to create a lot of jobs. You know, if we're going to build a lot of wind farms and solar arrays, if we're going to go redo buildings, you know, across the United States, if we're going to redo the grid, that's a lot of jobs. So when we think about environmental justice, the question is, who's getting the jobs and what are they getting paid? If you think about how it's going to transform working communities, the question is, are those people going to get the jobs? Are they going to be the kind of jobs that, you can, that are middle class jobs that you can raise a family on? So when we think about how this is really, environmental justice is clean air for kids and jobs that actually you can support a family on and have a dignified life over. So that is an absolutely essential part of what we're trying to do, but it's also something that people really feel. And they're very aware of the idea. It is really important that the coalition pushing these ideas not just be the traditional, what people think of as the traditional environmental coalition. It is really important the coalition behind this is broad-based and includes every part of society. And that's a critical part, too, of... That's also a critical part of uh, when you get to putting a price on carbon, cap and trade, uh, carbon tax, whatever the mechanism is, that uh, that doesn't unfairly burden people at the lower end of the income spectrum, which if you don't have aggressive measures to make sure that happen, it will. And that was a big actual part of the legislation that was being developed in Congress was to make, the, you know, some of the hardest parts of that was actually developing a system that, that uh, was fair to people. All right, well, we're getting close to the end here, so I've got uh, one more question. I'd like to give all the panelists an, an opportunity to answer it, and it's, it's pretty big and broad, so you can answer it. Uh, yes. From me. <laughs> Thank you, Mike, you've taken up your time. Um, uh, and, but it, it is a question from the audience, and it, it, it goes back to, to the comments that, that Tom started with. What is the long game? This is a struggle that even as uh, we move things as fast as we can, it's going to take decades. So assuming that we get on this clean energy revolution, what is the long game? W when do we end up? Is, is uh, 50 by 30 enough or do we have to do more? So I, I'll start, uh, give Thanks, everyone Michael. else a chance to think <laughs> about that. Um, uh, and I actually, I'm gonna talk about what the short game is to get to the long game a little bit, which you know, I was talking to Tom earlier, and I, I have this truism about Washington that I think everything is impossible until it becomes inevitable. And, and, and I think that's really true of a lot of issues. I think if you look at most big things that have been accomplished in Washington, not too long before they were accomplished, everyone was saying that they were impossible. And so I think a lot of the battle right now is turning this from being impossible, which I think most people, it sort of looks that way right now, to inevitable. And I, I agree with what other people have said, that that kind of starts with a bottom-up thing and, and people getting active and people connecting to their political leaders and then the political leaders start saying, you know, this is going to happen. I want to be out in front of this. I want to, not just for narrow political reasons, but if something's inevitable, everyone wants to get the train on the train. So even if you represent narrow, some narrow self-interest, you want to make sure whatever the inevitable thing that happens, happens, that your self-interest uh, that you're representing uh, 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 comes out okay in it, and it just, it, it gathers momentum. So, you know, whatever the long game is, we have to, it, that will work out once we, once we turn from it being impossible to something that's inevitable that has to happen that's an imperative. Well, I'll give you my perspective. I came to this country about 44 years ago, and I still have the hope that this is the only country in the world that can self-criticize there is no other country that can self-criticize. And I have still faith in that and we'll come out of it and we'll do the right thing. So 
so I, I think I think Michael's laid great context. Um, I would I would point to kind of a little bit on that just because that's my role apparently the state level and technical feasibility. Um, we we need to restructure the way we compensate and regulate our utilities. Uh, they are they are dictated by law to not join us in this because because we force them to make their money on the volume of the sale of electricity. That doesn't make any sense. We should reward them for selling less electricity because we've implemented energy efficiency and distributed generation. And all I have to do, and I know this is hard to say in New Hampshire, but look across the border at Vermont. Um, <laughs> they, their goal is 90% is renewable by 2050. And why are they gonna do that? Because they have a utility called Green Mountain Power. If you don't know anything about Green Mountain Power, learn it. This is the model for the future. We need a new utility, we need a new government, and we need a new group of people that are demanding that this is what we want. So, I mean, what is the long game? The long game is a better world. I mean, this is our, if you look at what's going on in our society right now, there's lots of success. You know, if you look at the medical breakthroughs, they're actually pretty incredible, what's going on. If you look at the IT, it's pretty incredible in terms of what we now take for granted that 10 years ago didn't exist. Um, but we have this gigantic challenge in terms of sustainability. And the question is, are we in fact going to hand on a better world in the way that traditionally Americans have always handed on a better world? And it's, it is, of course, energy and climate, but that's not all that it is. You know, when we talk about species disappearing at a thousand times the normal rate, that's not normal. When you, you know, if you talk about losing half the species on the planet by 2100, that's a, you know, historical event, not for a century or a millennium. That happens, you know, every million years or something. This is the sixth time it's happened in the history of the planet. So when we look at the challenge, what is it we're trying to hand, what, what are we trying to do? It's a very broad-based thing that is actually gives incredible meaning to the life of everyone in this room to actually do the right thing. So when we think about the long game, the long game is for us to actually pull together in exactly this way that is incredibly important and gives all of our lives. I look at it as the most, the greatest opportunity that anyone in this room will ever have for meaning in their life is to be able to do that, in my opinion. And that's the long game. One thing that is discussed a lot in the UN climate negotiations is adaptation. Um, like the person that wrote that question mentioned, even if we stop all fossil fuel emissions right now, this is gonna continue for a while. So for me, the long run is working to adapt people. And that makes the movement look more complicated than it actually is. But there's a lot of very smart and motivated people. So working to adapt and shift to clean energy just takes good planning. All right, well, I'd just like to close out by thanking you all uh, for coming and joining us today and asking some great questions. And how about a big round of applause for our whole panel? Yeah.